1999, there wasn't a lot of information about 22Q, and Judy was desperately trying to find answers for her daughter, Chelsea. They had traveled all the way to D.C. to see a special geneticist, and as they were waiting in the doctor's room, a man walked past their door. He stopped abruptly and then continued walking. That same man came into the room moments later with a napkin in his hand and handed it to Judy. On the napkin, it said, Velocardiofacial Syndrome. He introduced himself, that he was the geneticist they were meeting with that day, and this was the diagnosis he felt her daughter had. This was the beginning of Judy and Chelsea's 22Q journey. Welcome to the 22Q podcast. My name is Becky White, and today I am beyond thrilled to have our guest. I met this beautiful, beautiful woman at the 22Q Moms Retreat, and her name is Judy, and she's just a ray of light and so many of the moms that were at the retreat just kept saying, have you met Judy? Have you met her? She is just a ball of fire and has so much information and so much experience around 22Q having her own daughter and Judy welcome. And just please introduce yourself to our audience. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. That was very sweet. Um, I'm Judy Gorin and I have, um, I've been married for 37 years. Um, they have not all been in bliss. Um, <laughs> as everyone knows, I have two children. Uh, Chelsea is my oldest and she's 33 and she's, she's my 22 Q and I have a son who will be 30 in four days. And he's married and has a baby. So I have a grandbaby, a little Aww. baby girl, Iris. So um, that's that's me in a nutshell because my whole life revolves around my children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And where are you from? I'm from Richmond, Virginia. So I'm a hairdresser by trade. But when I had Chelsea, I stopped working full time and have not been able to work full time in, in the 33 years. So, and, and that was a choice I made and, it, and I'm happy that I did that. Um, I also am a CASA volunteer, which is a court appointed special advocate. And I have done that for the last 11 years. And um, that is, uh, you're appointed by the courts to help out children that are in really bad situations, abusive, yeah. high risk, everything. and. Um, so I've been doing that on, on the side. We love the beach. We love family time. I come from a big family and I live in the middle of three out of my four siblings. There's five of us. Wow. And I did that because I wanted Chelsea to be around her 12 first cousins growing up so that they could help and kind of make it a little village for her. And they're her friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's wonderful that you have a big family because not everybody does. And do you find that that has helped you along the way navigating Chelsea's 22Q, having that support system nearby? Oh, absolutely. Because when she was born, I did not live here. And I was away. And um, so I got back here when she was six years old. So, wow. yeah. So the first six years were, were really tough. Just yeah not having anybody around to help. And, and my husband traveled all the time. So oh. he's, yes, he's a retired secret service agent and he was gone, you know, at least 30 days at a time. And then wow. he'd come back for a couple of weeks and then leave for another 30 days. So for the first 15 years of her life and the first 11 years of my son's, um, it was me and the kids. Wow. Wow. So let's start at the beginning. Where was Chelsea born? And when did you first find out she had 22 Q? Let's, let's start at the beginning. So uh, we lived in New Jersey when she was born. She, well, it was 30 hours of labor 30. She just couldn't come out. And I kind of figured I kind of after years later, when I found out what she had, I know now that she couldn't with her low muscle tone and that just kind of all fit, you know? So um, I lived up in Jersey until she was two, and then we moved to Northern Virginia. When she was about six months old, 
I kept a baby that was only a month older than her. And I could tell that Chelsea was just not developing. She, this little girl would watch my dogs run into the room and, and then try to chase them. And Chelsea, by the time she even noticed the dog, her head turned when she came into the room and then she'd run to the other side and Chelsea's head wouldn't move with her. Right. And so for, uh, and she had been sick from the time she was about two months old. She had a terrible case of bronchitis. She had uh, just, she was constantly sick constantly sinus infections just as a ba little baby she ended up with tubes and all that so I, I would tell my pediatrician and they just said that I was comparing her to other kids and I, I just wasn't now she was my first so they just didn't really want to listen you know and 33 years ago was they didn't have a whole lot on any of this I moved from there went to northern Virginia and by the time she was two she, by that time she had, you know, hadn't walked until she was about 19 months old. She had already had tubes and mm -hmm. um, thinking that would make it better. It was about two and a half. I found a, a pediatrician in Richmond. I was living in Northern Virginia, but I, I found one in Richmond, which was an hour and a half away. And she told me to go and have her tested through the school. And so I did. And they found her to be developmentally delayed in all areas. And she qualified for five day a week elementary school special ed. And she was only two and a half. They suggested I go get her hearing checked. I thought she was deaf, but she really wasn't saying anything. She wasn't talking. So I got to an ear, nose and throat guy at um, Children's Hospital in DC. And we walked in and he took one look at her and he said, um, she doesn't look normal to me. She looks like she's got a genetic disorder. And he said, I'll check her hearing, but I don't believe that that's what it is. And he came back and said, you need to go to a geneticist. So we go to a geneticist at Children's and he is the top guy over there. And I noticed him walking past the door, noticed him stop, stopping. And then when he, they called us back, I went back there and he had written down on a napkin he said, I'm 99% sure that your daughter has this syndrome. And it, at the time, they called it velocardiofacial syndrome. And he had been doing research on this. Yeah. And so he, he listened to her heart and he said, did I ever tell you she's got a really loud heart murmur? And you know, think you need to go to a cardiologist? I'm like, no, she'd been sick from day one, literally every week. And no one ever mentioned her heart. So we go to a cardiologist and they find she's got a VSD. She's got an aneurysm in there. She's got a right aortic arch. She's got a distorted aortic valve. Um, she's got a cervical aorta. Then they say, we've waited this long, two and a half years before when she had this. So we're going to watch her each year. And I had to go back every three months for a heart echo and to see if she had to have surgery. Well, right. we waited three years and they, and the aneurysm that was in there moved over and closed the hole in the VSD. Oh, she has a mitral valve prolapse as well, but it's very small. So they've been watching that for 30 years. And, and um, we, go, yeah, we go to the cardiologist every six months and now it's every year. Um, they found she had an immune deficiency, the brain MRI and found she had lesions in her brain and she had a cyst in her brain. That's where it all started. And then Dr. Rosenbaum was my geneticist who I just absolutely adored. And he got us hooked up with the Education Foundation for below cardiofacial syndrome at the time. So I signed up for every research they had for her. I went every three years, they put her through all these psychologicals and everything just so I could see what her level was, you know. Um, and they did conferences every year that we could go to and the parents could go to. You'd have the doctors there. You could um, listen to all of their research. You could go to all the classes that they had. I did that. At all I went throughout the whole United States going to them. Mm -hmm. I probably went to, so I went for 18 years and, um, and then they stopped doing it because they have the internet and, you know, I didn't have the internet then. No. Yeah. No, this is the early 1990s. Yes. 
Oh yeah. So, yeah. The Yeah. She was born in 89 mm-hmm. and she's two and a half when I found out all this. So I learned through, um, they used to have a, uh, a newsletter that went out. It, it, it was great because the newsletters would come out and it'd have a story on there. Like one time Chelsea had, you know, she had started coming home from school and she would go in the closet and she would just binge eat. And I thought, oh man, she's finally eaten because she did have failure to thrive and everything her first year. I used to think, wow, she's growing now. She wants to eat. Well, it wasn't two days later that I get this newsletter. And there's a story of a boy who's seven and Chelsea was six at the time. And he was drowning his anxiety in food. And so when Chelsea was six, she was diagnosed with a generalized anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. And so it just, you, so then I could watch what she was doing and try and, you know, well, I got her to a therapist and everything. She's been going to a therapist off and on since she was six years old. Mm -hmm. Kudos to you for doing all of that for her, especially in the 1990s when you said there's no internet. No, I couldn't no, research anything. There's no Facebook groups. Nope. There's no texting. Yeah. Just did you feel isolated when she totally. was two and three? Yeah. Totally. Because um, you know, I was thinking about this today before this started. Chelsea and her age group, it was all a test run. I learned everything by doing it wrong the first time. And that's how I got through. Right. Yeah. There was no handbook for you. There was no 22 Q momentry for you. And her her group are the textbooks that they have now because those who signed up for the research, which I did, and I did it because I I needed it for me so I could help her, Mm -hmm. you know, so I could see what level she was at. That, that was how I looked at it. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't like putting her through things that were um, not necessary because that, you know, everybody was great, kind, it made it kind of fun for them. And mm-hmm. um, it said they, it saved my life. It, it saved her life. Yes. I was able to save her life. Right. And mm-hmm. back then when you went to Washington to see the geneticist and he finally took a, just took a look at her and then wrote that down on the napkin. What was your initial thought in that moment? You know? Um, okay. So back then it took nine months to get the result. Okay. Now it only takes maybe a week, you know, maybe a couple of days. It took nine months. They did like this molecular testing and it had to sit and do, you know, all this. So in the meantime, she'd been in and out of the hospital for infections and then she got Kawasaki's disease. It's a, a bacterial infection that you could get it from carpets that were being cleaned. You could get, we have no idea where she got it. It could have happened at school, but she was the only one that got it. And um, it's very dangerous if it's not diagnosed, which is a clinical diagnosis. So you don't do a blood test, but you have to have, you know, a certain number of, and Chelsea had all of them. And thank goodness for my pediatrician, because I'd never heard of it. And um, she had, she was so sick. And she ended up in the hospital and they put them on um, gamma globulin for 24 hours. And that takes the risk of it developing into heart disease down from 75% to a 2%. And it's because it was caught. So she went in and did that. And so the Kawasaki's disease has always been um, a fear that later on she'll develop the heart disease which she already has the heart defects, um, right. from the Kawasaki's, um, that happened when she was two and a half, three. Oh my gosh. Years. Talk about stressful. So, while we were in, um, the cardiologist is the one that, um, called my geneticist after nine months because he used to work for Philadelphia children's and he said to call me and let me know, have we gotten the results back yet? And sure enough, the doctor called and he said that she has velocardiofacial syndrome. So my feeling on that was I knew it. I knew there was something. Everybody made me crazy. And to me, I was absolutely relieved that I had a name 
Mm-hmm. And it's a blood test. So it's not something that when you go to the school system that it's a clinical diagnosis, it's a blood test. And so um, I was relieved. I was relieved. Mm-hmm. And then I looked at it like, okay, now um, how do I take care of her? What do I do? Mm-hmm. What what does this look like? What does 22 right. cute, or, you know, velocardiofacial look like? Right. And you yeah. were in a really good part of the country with a lot of good medical help with- yes. I yeah. was because I was living in Northern Virginia at the time. Right. So you mm-hmm. have a lot of great, great hospitals and yes. leading and the way. To be, you know, doing research on this syndrome, you know, and, but I always call it fate. It's it. I'd really do. Mm-hmm. I have a very strong faith. Right. I mm-hmm. pray and say, okay, I, I need an answer. And it really does come. It could come in a dream. It could come. I could bump into somebody I know, you know, mm-hmm. it just, it, it mm-hmm. happens. It's, it's real for me. Right. And you had shared at the 22 Q moms retreat, you know, we all, all the young moms kept coming to you asking like, what's next. So you always mentioned, and I'll never forget it, that the first it's medical, it's all medical. When, yep. when the kiddos are young, talk about the next phase of school and IEP and advocacy. What was that like for you and Chelsea? Um, yeah, that, that, it, that was, um, let's just say I made a path on that one too public schools weren't paying for private placement. Okay. And it was unheard of. So I stayed in the public school system from two and a half until fourth grade. So fourth grade IEP comes up. So fourth grade was tough. It was, um, she was really having a horrible time. She was having these spells, which we thought were, she was having seizures because at some point she had had a seizure in her life because the EEGs had shown that. So she was on medication for that. But um, she started having these spells. And so that went all the way through fourth grade. Time to go to fifth grade and I walk into an IEP meeting and there's all these people I don't know. And I'm like, what's going on? You know, I thought I had a good relationship with her LD teacher and um, they were all there ready to tell me they were gonna ship Chelsea across the Cross town to another public school that could help her, which was not the right program. I can just tell you that. I built my house, literally built my house beside this elementary school for Chelsea to go there. Okay. Cause I could walk through the woods and she could see the house. There was a lot right beside it. And we built our house there. They decided this is what was best for her. And that is the first time I ever said, nope, not signing it. I am not signing it. I went to, we have a special school here that I had been looking at for a couple of years and um, it was kind of expensive. So, you know, I was, I went and looked at the school and I told them what had happened and they said, you call them up and tell them you want to reconvene. So I did. And they said, oh, I'm sorry, it's summer vacation. So they had made my IEP the last day of school, which had never happened. I did not see this coming. So once that happened, I said, oh no. So we went and found um, a lawyer that helps with IEPs and all this kind of stuff. So what we did, we did all of it ourselves. So what we did was we wanted to make sure legally that we were taking her out of public And we still had the right to ask for funding. So we learned this letter and we had had the lawyer check it out. And it's basically telling the public school, um, I'm taking my child out for private placement at public expense. So you have to put that in there. And um, the first year we, we paid for it because it was, they made it so that it was almost impossible to get that done. Okay. So when she went to this special school and it was a, it's a private school for children with learning disabilities, but with across the board learning disabilities and with, um, you know, um, low to average IQs. So she'd have peer models. Yes, exactly. And, Mm -hmm. um, and at the time they had 50 kids in in the school. The first year it showed me that she'd never had one of those spells, what, which were seizures. Okay. So I took her to a neurologist and had a 48 hour EEG done. They 
called me and she said, Judy, she's not having electrical seizure. She's having stress induced panic anxiety attacks that makes her body act as if she's having a seizure. I mean, like she would throw up on herself at school and nobody would call me. She, she would be walking around with dried throw up on her. Aww. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You're going to love this. So I walked over to the school cause I live right here and I went into the principal's office and I walked over to her. They, they would always see me coming and not, you know, they'd say, Oh, she's busy enough. So I said, I think she's going to want to talk to me. So I went in there and I said, well, I just came over here to tell you that I have declared war on you, the school, the school district, and um, I'm not going to sue y'all for an inappropriate program anymore because that's what we were going for. I said, I'm going to sue you for pain and suffering. I said, my daughter has been here for two years having these spells, six of them a day, and she's been at this school and she has not had a single one. I just found out that she had, she's having stress-induced panic anxiety attacks. They're not seizures. And it's at your hands. I've given you everything to read about my daughter and you didn't take care of her. And I said, and you're top on my list. I said, I got a, I got a lawyer who will do it pro bono. And I have a friend of mine that is in the Associated Press and she wants to do an article tomorrow. And for the very first time, she dropped her pen. She looked up at me and she said, you get me that in writing and I'll see what I can do. And that's exactly what I did. And I got to this place, to this place, to this place. And Labor Day weekend of the next year, she calls me and she says, well, Judy, we have decided that um, Chelsea does need private placement at public expense. So they paid eight years of her education, and I was the second person, the second one with this school district in Chesterfield County. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. You go, Mama. And her life changed an absolute life-altering experience going to right. that school. Like, Chelsea couldn't do the the testing, and she she would make their ratings go down. And so that's why they moved her to this other area where it didn't matter what the ratings were over there. And I said, no, I said, you're not going to do that to her. I said, there's a lot of things that, that is wrong with her, but her, her little brain, that's, that's, you know, no, you're, you're not going to take her and do that to her. No, and it's amazing that you were able to do that. It's amazing that the school actually listened and you were able to find that little piece from her documentation saying that they weren't seizures. They were panic attacks. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that and, was and the key. The There's yeah. a lot of times that you know, you want to have them admit they can't teach them, but they're never going to. Okay. So you got to beat them at their own game. Yeah. It's, it's sad. And it's very hard for many of the 22 Q kiddos because they're, they're ready to learn. They're, they're very enthusiastic. They're ready. They may be a little delayed educationally, but they're there. They're present. They want to be a part of the classroom community. And we've had educational professionals tell us with our kid, with our son, that we're not sure where he's going to fit. He's that, that different piece. He's not the extreme where he yeah. needs an extreme atmosphere or stream extreme classroom setting, but he's also might not excel in a typical classroom setting with typical standard um, testing. And it's so hard. It, it is because when you're in that gray area, which is where Chelsea was, um, and that even when they um, tested her in the deletion, he said, you know, Chelsea is, she's not in the extreme, but she's not in the light either. You're only going to find out what her limits are as she lives. The learning part was very hard for her. She's a great speller. I mean, she, you know, I kept telling them, you know, can you point out something good? She's a great speller. That part is is very difficult because um, she's very much aware, you know, right. and knows what her limits are. That's what makes it so hard. Yeah, she, this school saved her life. That's great. And what, do you mind sharing the name of the school? It's called North Star Academy. From Chelsea's schooling after that, what was next for her? What, what did her life look like? Yeah, that was um, 
that was to me terrifying. You know, her senior year, I think I cried from the, you know, the start of school. It, I'm starting to get teary eyed. That was a long time ago. Why was it? Why? What brings on the tears? It, because um, I was so scared for her. It, she was in this safe environment and then she had to go out into the real world. Okay. So, and then, and that's 10 times scarier. So um, as hard as it was fighting for everything for school, I knew where she was. I knew I could help her. So then when she um, was to graduate, I, I started looking around and we had a restaurant here that was called Positive Vibe Cafe. And they did, um, they did a um, training for, to work in the food business for young adults with disabilities. And he, he started this for his son who was in a wheelchair. And um, so she went to their, through their tra training. And then I told them when it was done, I said, I would love for her. I know y'all don't hire them, most of them out of the program, but it was a working restaurant as well. I would love for her to work here because people went there for that reason. They knew and I knew she'd be safe. And so when she finished the program, I didn't do anything. I just had a feeling that she might end up working there. And it was probably a month later and he called and asked if she had gotten a job yet. And I said, no, I've been waiting to see if maybe she can work there. And he goes, well, we would love to have her. So she worked there as a busser for eight years. Wow. And yes. And then um, the program kind of, the people kind of changed and all that. And so she was ready to move on. So um, she moved to a um, ACAC, which is a wellness center. And she was their towel girl. So she needs to be in a situation where um, the anxiety is not too much and it's not too hard to do. So all she did was wash, uh, dry, fold, and put the towels out at this gym. And she did that for four and a half years. Mm -hmm. And then my nephew opened up a car wash. And I, the, there were a few incidents at this wellness center where she was kind of in a small room with, you know, some temps that came to work and some of them were a little, um, mm, kind of gave her the, she was afraid of them. And I think it was because it was a, somebody that had asked her some questions that were probably a little bit inappropriate. So that's mm. what you're always worried about, you know, cause they're always, you know, so once that happened, I was like, okay, time to move on. And so right. my nephew's car wash opened up and now she's his towel girl. So she mm -hmm. just washes and dries and folds and puts the towels where they're supposed to go at his car wash. The next life altering experience for her when she got out was uh, and is Special Olympics. She has turned into this, this confident, uh, proud of who she is, proud of her difference. Special Olympics does that. And she is, um, she's a global messenger for them. She goes mm -hmm. and does speeches where she would never have done Aww. any talking at school or anything. She does speeches for companies, for schools, all about what Special Olympics has done for her and about mm -hmm. her life. And so she's on the board of trustees for the state of Virginia for Special Olympics mm -hmm. as their athlete representative. They have a young professional board for Special Olympics in Richmond. And they have her on that board um, as their athlete representative. That's incredible that she was able to find Special Olympics and have it be such a big part of her. It, it, it is our life. That's wonderful. It is, life. Yes. it is a great, great organization and program. It really and, is. and I tell them all the time <clears throat> that they truly are that organization that absolutely lives up to their mission. And other than Special Olympics, what other resources or pieces of advice could you give other families that may have an adult living with 22Q or may be just starting this journey? What sort of resources or websites or books or people have you met along your well, way? Like I said before, mine came from the Education Foundation and, um, and now you can find all kinds of stuff. Now this group, you know, the 22Q group is where they should they they can go because there's people at all ages that can help them wherever they are you know you know the the 
mental illness part is very difficult. Um, Chelsea does suffer from depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, panic, um, severe panic attacks. And um, a, it's called an anxiety-based psychosis that she has. So her world needs to be as less anxious as I can do it because if the anxiety takes over, then that's, that's what was happening at the schools. If the anxiety takes over, then she does get a psychosis. She does hear voices, she sees faces. And in the beginning, that was to me terrifying because we had always heard about schizophrenia, but it's a very different thing. It's not, they're in reality. It's, it's, it's um, manageable. Yeah. It, and it really how- is. And so what I would say, don't be afraid to give them medication because they're missing something. And they're missing it that needs to go and take messages to the brain. You mm-hmm. know, it was really hard. I was six years old and I gave her that first mind altering drug, but I had to. And I'll mm-hmm. never forget, I cried in my kitchen and I said, this is it because I know she'll be on medication for the rest of her life. And she's been on it since she was six years old. She's 33 mm-hmm. and it gives her a great quality of life. Um, I had a great doctor and that's what you need to look for. The earlier, the better. It's early intervention, just like with speech, OT, PT, did all that. And the the mental part is as hard as it is, the early intervention will save their life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The early intervention is another reason why I, I so believe in that is that Chelsea is so obsessed at making sure she takes her medication. You know, she she feels worse if she doesn't take it. That part is really important for families. Mm -hmm. Um, The other part is it's okay to fire a doctor. It's way okay to tell a teacher, no, that's not acceptable. It's way okay to stand up for yourself, for your child, and it will make a huge difference in their life. Mm -hmm. You're the advocate for your child. And I'll say too, what's important for when you find out, um, don't forget the sibling, even because, you know, if I could go back, I would change that. It's not, I didn't forget. I just thought he, I knew that things came easy for him and I knew that he could do it. And I was always right there with him to do whatever, but you, you need to pull out that special time for them as well, because they can only think their age, no matter what no matter how much they understand and get the fact that their sibling can't do the things that they can do, they right. can only think their age and it, it grows up, they grow up and it does, you do find out that there were things that did hurt them. Yeah. Have you been able to reconcile past things that have happened with your son and Chelsea and has he communicated that with you? Yes. He, and and I, I did that myself with him. I, I wanted him to know I, this was all such a battle for me. You know, I said, I know that there were probably things that I missed with you, but I, I know that, you know, I loved you. And he, and he does, you know, he said, I, absolutely. He knows that Chelsea I had to take him when he was a baby to the hospital when Chelsea had to go to the hospital because my husband wasn't here. So I'd have to take right. him. And, you know, he experienced those kind of things that were probably traumatizing to him that you think, well, they're with you. They're okay. Um, You don't think about those kind of things, Um, but the importance of explaining a whole lot better is what I would change. And I, and that's what I tell him that I would Mm -hmm. like to have gone back and, and been able to explain and let him explain to me how he felt more than anything. That's the key. It is. Give them an opportunity to share with you absolutely, and for for you to be open to hearing exactly, exactly what they're going to say. Yeah. No, you, you need to be open to um, how they feel. And I think that's so important because I'm doing that now. And my son is a grown man. Um, He'll be 30 on on Friday. You know, I want him to know that his feelings did did mean something to me and they really mean something to me now. And I want him to always feel like he can let me know that. And that is one of the most important things I would say Mm. to 
parents. Have you found that now that he's a dad, he's starting to understand the stress and oh, the, absolutely, the constant worry of, are they okay? I need to do this. Does it open up his perspective a little bit? Oh, absolutely. It does. Not every parent like yourself is willing to have that conversation. So that's amazing that you have and open the dialogue, just open the dialogue. Yes, absolutely. You know, I learned, um, I was sitting in, um, one of the, you know, conference stuff out there at the 22 Q somebody started talking about, um, I think it was about one of their the siblings, the younger one, and that they were able to talk to them at that time. And it really, I mean, I, I really, I came home and I, and I called my son and I mm-hmm. told him, I said, you know, I don't think that I realized that you needed the time to talk to me. And he, and he appreciated it. And he, yeah. he acknowledged that that was a real thing. Yeah. Yeah. So it, I even learned something yeah. at the, at this 22 Q, you know, with everybody's younger ones and I'm, and I can place myself there just because it was 30 some years ago. Very it's ongoing. Real. Yes. It's very real. Yeah. And it's, it's still new every day. And how is Chelsea? You know, if you could use one word to describe her, what would that word be? It would be brave. Yeah. 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 What does she like to do? She loves music. Yeah. She loves to go to concerts. Um, she loves being with her cousins. She mm-hmm. loves, you know, one of the hardest things for me as a mom is um, watching her watch them grow and they all grow past, you know, and the youngest one just got out of college. And um, she, the one thing she's always said is, mom, I just wish I could have one day in their life just to see what it's like, you know, because she was never able to drive. You know, she can't do more than one thing at a time. So for safety reasons and, you know, wasn't able to pass the test or anything. So, and that's okay. And she's okay with that because it's kind of scary on the road for her. But she loves to go to, she loves her Special Olympics. That is her life. But she also loves to go to these these conventions for like shows, um, like One Tree Hill. She is a big One Tree Hiller. We've gone to two of their conventions. They're down in Wilmington. So she loves Wilmington now. So we'll make trips down there, but they'll do these conventions, you know, once or twice a year. And now she's gotten into a group of women that are maybe just a little bit younger than me that um, love these things and they take her under their wing and they'll Aww. go in with her. So when they have these, these conventions, you can um, buy some photo ops and things like that. And then they have fun trivia nights and things to play. So we'll do those like twice a year, fun things that she can keep up with on online. She loves to be. If you could go back in time for when she got her diagnosis for 22 Q what would you say to yourself in that moment? Um, I would say to myself, it is okay to ask people to help you. It's okay. It would be okay to ask somebody, can you go watch, can you watch my baby while I go take her to her appointment? It would be okay to, to find someone that, you know, you can call and you can cry with. That's very important. I kept everything inside. I just did it all myself. And and that included, you know, my husband was, um, like I said, he was away a lot. So everything I did, I just, you know, kept it in. I didn't want to see, I didn't want my kids to see that I was sad or, you know, always wanted, wanted to be upbeat. And, you know, two years ago, just this past Friday, I was diagnosed with cancer. And, um, I've been through, I'm still going through treatments. I've, I've mm-hmm. got till June and, you know, and you know, I, like I said, not an option not to beat it. So yeah. I'm beating it. I am going to, Heck no yeah. what everybody says, yeah. I, I do think, you know, I didn't do enough to take care of me. And that is something I think is very important. And I think the young moms have more, are more aware of that than we ever were my generation 
Definitely. And so my generation just, you know, you suck it up. That's what you do. And so I was really happy that, you know, the y'all young moms worked on these retreats for the parents, you know, and for the moms to come and just um, let it out because um, that's not what we did. Yeah. And if you, well, when Chelsea listens to this, what do you want her to know from you? Every, so every time, every time I talk about her, this is what happens. <laughs> um, Take your time. I would want her to know that I wouldn't change a thing about her. That I want to be her when I grow up because she truly is the bravest girl I know. She truly is the most innocent, caring, loving person that I know that only wants good. She only wants good for everybody. And she, you know, doesn't under, understand how other people don't have that and see that, you know, like she's so kind to everybody. And when someone's not, that it just sticks with her forever. And that I want her to know that she's stronger than she thinks she is. I want her to know she's smarter than she thinks she is. And I want her to know, don't ever, ever change one thing about you. And to know, always be proud of who you are, always. And that I love her with my whole being. And she is my heart. Ah, I love it. It's so yeah. true that Isn't it? I, it's so true. Cause even my son, he's just the most innocent, yes. happiest person. Well and said. She's 33 and, um, and that innocence never goes away. She's just, yeah. she changes people. And I think that these kids change people. And she used to always ask me, you know, why? do I have this? And I always say, because you were picked to change people's lives. You've changed mine. You've changed my whole family. You've changed your dad's. You've, you've changed your brothers. You know, you changed how we see the world and she sees it as a beautiful place. And, and I just wish that more, you know, people could look through their eyes and see see the world the way they do mm -hmm. well judy that was perfect in every way and you are beautiful and you are just such an incredible mom and chelsea and your son are so lucky to have you as their mom and i want to thank I'm, you for today thank you so much i am so lucky to have them there i'm the lucky one yeah well thank you again for being on and thank you for being... doing this you're gonna thank help you. a lot of people Hey, you are by sharing your story. Well, I hope so. I <laughs> yeah. hope so. Thanks again. Okay. Thank you. Judy, thank you so much for sharing Chelsea's story with me today and for being on the podcast and for being such a wonderful role model for all of us younger moms. I'll never forget how you told Chelsea that you were meant to change people's lives. And I plan on using that line myself because it's so true. Thank you for that gift. And to all of our listeners, I just want to say thank you so much for your continued support and for listening to this podcast. If you'd like to contact me, you can reach me at 22qpodcast at gmail.com with any questions or if you're interested on being on this podcast. And until next time, never forget 22Q family that you are not alone.